Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt. And his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. And by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You know, the letter Noon, <laughs> the letter Noon in Arabic, they said the plural is Ninan, which means they're saying Noon now means fish. Just because in the Surah Noon, wal qalami wa ma yasturun, they said Noon might mean a fish. So they're saying here Ninan means fish because Noon, the letter Noon, all of a sudden means fish. Wash shams and the sun. Even if, okay, so the alcohol, okay, check this out. The alcohol was slaughtered by the noons and the sun. <laughs> I mean, what on earth is that even on about? But then they're all like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes brilliant, beautiful sense. Hundreds of thousands of people in Nineveh turned to the Lord in repentance. There is no natural explanation for a massive conversion of hundreds of thousands of people. There's only a supernatural explanation, and that is that God determined to save that city in that generation. And He used a rebellious prophet to bring a rebellious people to faith in Himself. Just a staggering and wonderful story. The king, whatever his name, he exchanged his royal robes for sackcloth and ashes and he humbles himself. Public display of personal mourning. 
And the whole city does that. And then you come to verse 10, when God saw their deeds and that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which He had declared He would bring upon them, and He didn't do it. God showed them mercy, an astounding impact by a deeply flawed, bitter, racist, antagonistic prophet whom God uses as the human instrument for one of the most massive expressions of divine grace in history. He's certainly an unlikely hero. The whole city of Nineveh repented. The whole city, the king, everybody. They came down, put sackcloth and ashes, which is a symbol of humiliation. You, you would think he would go back, and, and if nothing else, for his own credibility as a prophet to tell the tale. So remind, O oh prophet, you are only a reminder. And you know the story. We've gone through the story uh, in years past, but in connection with the book, I, I want to reiterate it one more time to you. The opening chapter of Jonah is set in the midst of a, an intense storm. Let's look at chapter 1 and let's understand what the storm really was. And we can start in verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. This was generated by God Himself. This is a violent storm that God created supernaturally. This storm must have felt supernatural and maybe a little bit personal to them. It must have been, they thought, some God that was offended. This, they even understood, was not a storm that could be explained naturally. This storm had to be explained supernaturally. So the story of Jonah takes place at the outset in the midst of this storm. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me." The prophet here is commissioned to go and cry against the city of Nineveh. Nineveh. The mandate is clear, unmistakable, preach a message of judgment, preach a message of warning. Tell them that God is going to judge them. Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. This is his commission. Now we all know his response. Uh, he goes the other direction. His reaction is to get out, to run the other direction, to flee as far away as he can possibly go. He doesn't want anything to do with going to Nineveh and preaching to the Ninevites. He has no interest in obeying God whatsoever. Why? He's a racist, basically. He's a racist with a rotten attitude. He's just a bad attitude prophet, just a melancholy, bitter, kind of a down-in-the-mouth, bad mood prophet. And he has no interest whatsoever in obeying God. So he goes the opposite direction from where God told him to go. The ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. If they can get the ship up out of the water a little bit, there's less likelihood that it'll fill with water. You've got to be pretty tired to sleep in a situation like that. But there he was, sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, how is it that you're sleeping? That's the question I would ask. There really isn't an answer. Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. The bottom line is in paganism that somebody on this boat has offended a God. We need to find out who it is so that He can do something to appease the offended gods. And so it fell then to Jonah to be recognized as responsible for angering 
His God or the gods and bringing about this life-threatening storm. I just put the story together at that point. Jonah had been told to go to Nineveh, a great city, and cry against that city because of its wickedness. This, this is a prophet now, remember. This is a prophet. What do prophets do? They preach. They warn. They pronounce judgment. They call people to repentance. This is a prophet. This is what prophets do. But instead of heading toward Assyria and the capital city of Nineveh, he gets on a ship going to the westernmost part of the Mediterranean. Tarshish is essentially Gibraltar. He's going to go all the way to where the Mediterranean Sea dumps into the Atlantic. He didn't want to go to the Assyrian capital, which was clear to the east, way off in the desert next to the Tigris River. And by the way, an exceptionally large metropolis, Nineveh. It boasted in ancient times a population, and this is really amazing, a population of 600,000 people, exceptionally large city. Uh, it had um, been built originally by a man named Nimrod. You remember that name from Genesis 10 and 11. Nineveh then was the ultimate pagan capital. And every Ninevite, every Assyrian was, as far as Jonah was concerned, a pagan enemy and represented everything evil and everything that Israel hated. Nineveh was as wicked, by the way, as it was impressive. The Assyrians uh, were brutal. They were vicious. They massacred their enemies. They mutilated their captives. They are known to dismember and decapitate, burn people alive. Indescribable gory forms of torture marked their behavior toward their enemies. And they posed and had posed for a long time a clear and present danger to the national security of Israel. He knew the threat of the Assyrians and he hated them. He didn't want anything to do with the Assyrians. And amazingly, he didn't want the Assyrians to repent. Now when, when you don't want people to repent, that's deep-seated hatred. That's deep-seated hatred. He didn't want to take a message of hope. He didn't want to take a message of forgiveness. He didn't want to take a message of grace to these hated pagan enemies, violent annihilators of everyone who stood in their path. He wanted God to judge them. He wanted God to destroy them. He had an aggressive hatred toward those people. Of course, God was fully aware of in Nineveh's iniquity after Jonah and the repentance of the Ninevites uh, during Jonah's ministry, the Lord would come back and condemn that nation that took Israel captive. And He would condemn them through the prophet Nahum, another prophet would pronounce judgment on them. And at that time, Nahum would indict Nineveh for arrogance, deception, idolatry, sensuality and violence. God was going to destroy the Ninevites. But for this generation alive in Jonah's day, He had plans of salvation for them. Wonderful insight into the sovereign purposes of God. And Jonah was commissioned to deliver the message. But the rebellious prophet didn't want to see Israel's enemies receive mercy. In fact, he knew the Lord would forgive the Ninevites if they repented. Chapter 4, verse 2, he prayed to the Lord and said, "'Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that You are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. I knew You'd do this. I knew You'd forgive those people, and I couldn't stand the thought of that. Now that's racism. That's deep stuff for a prophet. You know, if I was in charge of who gets to be a prophet, I would say, you're disqualified, I'm taking somebody else. But God is in the business of using the most unlikely people in His purposes. Knew God was compassionate, 
full of loving kindness and mercy, and he didn't want God to act mercifully toward the Ninevites, so he got on a boat and went west. Knew his duty, shirked his duty. You know, you would think that God would just throw him on the dump, throw him on the, the old prophet's dump and say, you're done, your career is over. Find somebody else. Find somebody else. You got lots of folks to choose from. You don't need this guy. But here again is this wonderful reality that God is in the business of using the most unlikely and sometimes the most unqualified people. This is a blessed book which we have revealed to you, that they might reflect upon its verses, and that those of understanding would be reminded. Jonah's calling was unique. He was sent out of his nation to go to Nineveh, which was unusual for a prophet to leave either Judah or Israel. He prophesied about the nations and against the nations outside. But in Jonah's case, he actually was called to go to the capital of Assyria. Israel not only failed to be a missionary nation, but Israel rejected the prophets that God gave them. Israel rejected their God-given prophets. Jesus said, you killed the prophets. You stoned the prophets. You failed in your missionary task. And the God-appointed men who were to call you to that missionary task, you hated and you killed. As an unfaithful, arrogant, apathetic people caught up in nothing but superficial worship of God, at the same time worshiping idols and living any way they wanted to live, failed to do what God has called them to do and failed to listen to the messengers that God has sent. Jonah somehow has imbibed this anti-evangelism mentality, and he's a prophet. He's supposed to be calling the people to do this ministry of proclaiming the true God to the nations, and he himself is reluctant to do it. I think in a sense Jonah is sent to Nineveh uh, to shame Israel, to shame Israel. You say, well, how, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Because when he went, the whole city repented and believed, and was forgiven and redeemed. And what a rebuke that was against all those Jews who had nothing but animosity, bitterness, and hatred toward the nations around them and were unfaithful to take the message of the true and gracious God to those nations. What a rebuke it would be to find out that if you had done that, this could have been the response. The heathen city of Nineveh rep repented at the preaching of a reluctant prophet. You remember Jesus used Nineveh to admonish the unbelieving Pharisees of His day who refused to repent at the preaching of the greatest of all prophets with all the evidence that He was the Lord and the Messiah. If the heathens would repent in Nineveh, over the preaching of a reluctant, racist, bad-attitude prophet. We relate to you, O prophet, the best of stories in what we have revealed to you of this Quran, although you were before it among the unaware. The prophets and Jesus Himself and John the Baptist who said, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you snakes? Always introduce the message of grace and forgiveness by warning the sinner of the consequences of his sin. Jonah, however, is the one minor prophet, as they're called, that everybody knows about because of the amazing character of the story, backward, grudging, recalcitrant, racist. You would have thought that God just chuck him and get somebody else, but God doesn't do that. Well, meanwhile, we find Jonah, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. You know, it would have been enough to just get rid of Jonah. I mean, why go to all this trouble? I don't know what efforts 
in one sense, God had to go to to create this kind of fish big enough so that a man could float around in its stomach. Uh, we, don't, we don't know any details about it except we do know that there is a word in Hebrew for whale and that's not the word used here. So this is not some kind of warm-blooded mammal. This is some kind of fish, uh, cold and wet, unimaginable, indescribable, a three-day stay inside a fish, cramped in clammy darkness, suffocating stench. It's a miraculous thing that he survives in the fish. I, don't ask me about the breathing part. I don't know about that. There is a hadith from the most reputable Shia source that quotes Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, one of Muhammad's infallible descendants according to Shia doctrine, as saying the following. The whale which is carrying the earth secretly said to itself that it is carrying the earth by its own strength. So Allah the High sent to it a fish smaller than a palm's length and larger than a finger. So it entered in its gills and shocked it. It remained like that for 40 days. Then Allah raised it and was merciful to it and took it out. So whenever Allah intends the earth to be in a quake, He sends that small fish to that big fish. So when He sees it, it becomes restless. So the earth gets engulfed by the earthquake. There is another hadith about this whale in the Shia hadiths, also attributed to the same Imam, but Shias will no doubt tell us that this hadith, which is trying to explain how earthquakes happen, is not authentic, and to a degree, they don't actually hold hadiths as sacrosanct like many Sunnis do with Bukhari and Muslim. But nevertheless, we can see very clearly that this myth of the earth lying on the back of a giant whale is not isolated. It's found in numerous places in both Sunni and Shia Islam. It's found in many credible Islamic texts and sourced to companions like Abdullah bin Abbas, who was largely recognized as an expert on what the Quran means. We also found a few authentic narrations to back this up. The word Nun, which could be understood as a letter, is also used to refer to a whale in chapter 21 verse 87, where Prophet Jonah, Yunus in Arabic, is called the Nun, because he was swallowed in the story by a whale. So it appears very plausible that the meaning behind this verse was indeed referring to this very large whale that carries the earth on its back. Now, just to be clear, Despite the evidence I've just laid out as to why this whale story could in fact be the actual meaning for the verse I cited, my argument is not, I repeat not, that the Quran clearly mentions the story of the great whale, because we only find it clearly stated in interpretations and hadiths, and not through a literal reading. My argument is as follows. If the Quran is completely perfect and it is best understood, perhaps only understood, by scholars who dedicated their lives to understanding its content, then why did many highly credible Muslim scholars speak about a giant whale that carries the earth on its back? Surely if the Quran spoke clearly about the true realities of our world, these top scholars wouldn't have given this whale story any credibility whatsoever. If the best Islamic scholars were dead wrong, then why ask me to speak to today's Islamic scholars, who are only basing their understanding on what previous Islamic scholars had said? Will I be getting the original understanding of Islam, or will it be heavily reinterpreted because of the influence of today's social norms and modern scientific understanding? How can we trust their interpretation of any other verse for that matter? If they were all so wrong on this verse, and pretty much in agreement on their mistake, how do we know that they understood any other verses correctly? If people who dedicated their entire lives to understanding Islam and the Quran can reach such poor conclusions despite their great dedication, well, what hope does that give us that we can understand it any better? After Jerusalem, the next stop is in Kufa. The Hadith says, when he comes to Kufa, he will be confronted by a large crowd. Another Hadith actually puts a number to it, 10,000 people who will come before the Imam and they will say to him, La hajata lana libani Fatima. Ud min haythu atayt. Go back to where you came from. We don't need you or the children of Fatima to come and preach to us, to come and tell us what to do and what not to do. Now, what's interesting about this is that we're not talking about Mecca, we're not talking about Medina, we're not talking about Paris. We're not talking about Jerusalem. We're talking about Kufa. Kufa that's made up of what? It's made up of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. Right? And when 10,000 people approach the Imam and say to him, go back to where you came from, what does that tell us? It tells us this, brothers and sisters. Listen carefully. Prophets always came 
And part of their problem with the people that they were sent to, every prophet that was sent to his people, part of their problem was what? Being rejected by the people. But why? Why do you think people rejected their prophets? Because prophets challenged conventional wisdom. I want you to do the math. I want you to connect the dots. Prophets challenged conventional wisdom. Prophets challenged social norms. In other words, the problem that every prophet had was that he came to preach something that was completely diametrically opposed to how people were living their lives. Social norms were challenged by their prophets. That's why people rejected them. That's why people felt that the prophets were too, too difficult to digest. Their messages were too difficult to digest. And so they rejected those prophets. Which is why when Imam comes, the Shia in Kufa, <laughs> we're not even talking about every other place. The Shia of Kufa will reject Imam Imam. What does that tell you about where we're headed, about where we're going? It tells you that it's a very tough test that's coming up, brothers and sisters. Which is why Muhammad ibn Uthman, Abu Ja'far, says to Abu Abdullah, he says to him, listen, try not, don't, don't insist on meeting him. Because when you meet him, perhaps part of the reason, he doesn't spell this out, but part of the reason is, when you meet the Imam, that is the end of the conversation. If the Imam personally told you that, for example, such and such act in Islam is haram, and you reject it, you become a kafir. At least when you're being told that this act is haram through a scholar, through a speaker, through Mahdi Mudarrisi or anybody else, at the very least, there is some cushion there. At the very least, we can make up those excuses. But if the Imam himself told you that your lifestyle is evil, immoral, unacceptable, illicit, and you still choose to go against him, what does that make us? And what's hilarious is that the classical scholars like Al-Qabisi and these great early Maliki legends who were the early founders that had the manuscripts, the, the kind of tertiary manuscripts, they cross this out as a mistake because it makes no sense. Later scholars still embraced it and, this, and they try to justify what on earth this means. And they all seem to, you know, it's like a few people in a room, one person's justified and they're all like, yeah, that makes sense to me. <laughs> Let me just translate what that says. Zabah al khamra He slaughtered the alcohol. An ninanu No idea what ninan is. Do you know what they tried to say? Ninan is plural of the letter noon. You know the letter noon? <laughs> the letter noon in Arabic, they said the plural is ninan, which means they're saying noon now means fish. Just because in the Surah Noon Wal Qalami Wa Ma Yasturun they said Noon might mean a fish. So they're saying here Ninan means fish because Noon, the letter Noon, all of a sudden means fish. Was Shams and the sun. Even if, okay, so the alcohol, okay, check this out. The alcohol was slaughtered by the Noons and the sun. <laughs> I mean, what on earth is that even on about? But then they're all like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes brilliant, beautiful sense. It's like I read all these commentaries. People are like, nah, no, 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 uh, of course. I mean, it's, it's awkwardly worded, but it makes beautiful sense. <laughs> I'm like, for God's sake, at least be honest. Question is, who are the Vatican clergy worshipping? Here the Pope is blaming Satan for all the abuse scandals in the church. But what if I told you the Vatican worship Satan himself? Would you believe me? We are situated in a time 
where truth speakers are seen as liars and liars as truth speakers. The Hebrew Bible mentions him, the Vatican God, as the national god of the Philistines with temples at Ashdod and elsewhere in Gaza, modern day Palestine, a long standing association with the Canaanite word for fish. He is the fish god. Tony Blair worships the fish god. Dagon has nothing to do with God. Dagon is mentioned many times in the Bible as a pagan god. Why would the Vatican wear a headpiece to worship Dagon? It's in plain view. Have a look. Dagon is the Vatican god, none other than Iblis, Satan himself. He lives in the Holy See. It's not a coincidence. Hey, look there, that, you see, okay, if you could film that, a manual messianic gift shop. And you see there, there's a symbol of a fish intertwined with a symbol of a Jewish star and a menorah. The fish that you see there is one of the most ancient Christian symbols. It's older than using the cross as a symbol of Christianity. So what it is is merging together the fish which stands for Jesus Christ and the star, the Jewish star of David, in order to produce something where the lines have been blurred. And that, in, in effect, helps Jewish people, in their view, come to know about Jesus or Yeshua HaMashiach. In fact, inside you have the Lord's Prayer. It's in Hebrew. You worship a man as God. You believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. You, you pray, God says that I am not a man, that I lie, I won't change my mind, I'm not a mortal. And you just don't accept. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And I looked at it in Hebrew, and something leapt out at me, namely this. If you read the book of Jonah very carefully, you will see Jonah is not alive. He's dead. And it says it. Watch. Look. Is Jonah alive for three days? Jonah chapter 1 says this. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, and here's the key. Everyone skips the prayer. Watch his prayer. I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Now pause there. In the Old Testament, what is Sheol and the pit? What are those names for? It's names for the realm of the, of the dead.
and Allah is most knowing of what he sends down. They say, you are but an inventor of lies, but most of them do not know. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne. He issued a proclamation and it said, in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw His burning anger so that we will not perish." So they go to Jonah and they confront him. And the con confrontation takes place in verse 8, they said to him, tell us now. Tell us now. We don't have a lot of time here. On whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and from what people are you? Who are you? They're trying to figure out who this is and where he's come from and who he's associated with. Now, dig down to get to the bottom of all of these frightening issues. The lying missionary cutter have gotten to you, or the dirty rotten orientalists. That are going to take place under the anti-Messiah. People are going to think it's a good thing. He's going to heal those that are sick. He's going to heal those with cancer. Some people think he's even going to be raised from the dead. There's an obscure scripture in the book of Revelation that some interpret as being he's going to die and be raised back to life, that people are going to think this is God. Few people know the second karagma will be a literal name on the literal foreheads of literal people. Christians are in doubt uh, about it. Um, no, Christians are not and in have doubt. A cross of ash traced on their foreheads. This powerful symbol reminds us that we don't live forever. By receiving the cross of ash, we acknowledge our human frailty and our dependence upon God's healing grace. The 40 days us on our Christian pilgrimage. Christians are in doubt uh, about it. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt. Let's go to Revelation 13, starting at verse 16. The Bible says, He, speaking of the beast, also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. the name which Lucifer will use, presently known. The name of the beast or the number of his name. Verse 18, this calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is a man's number. His number is 666. There is no need. Allah knows best in your scholars and missionaries are liars. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. <laughs> the karagma will either be the number 666 or the karagma will be the name of the beast which will be tattooed on the foreheads of wicked people. 
Summarizing, we have two different places for the karagma, the right hand, the forehead. And we have two different karagmas, the number 666 and the name which the beast will use. What is embarrassing is your god was cursed on a tree. That's embarrassing. You're just mad because I've busted you. I've busted your pagan beliefs. I've given you proof you have been defeated. Allahu Akbar! And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Um, no, Christians are not in doubt about it. We know it was Jesus on the cross. He deceived all the people who belonged to this world. No, it's biscuits. He ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Uh, so, because I worship Jesus as God, God, because, well, he is God, uh, you as a Muslim believe that I will burn in hell for eternity because you believe that I'm committing shirk. Is that correct? Alhamdulillah, of course, but the question Allah is to tempt hellfire, the lying missionary cutter have gotten to you, or the dirty rotten orientalists. You! You are the liar! You and those evil missionaries! Allah knows best! Allah is the knower of all things! Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the sacrifice for sin that saved the Ninevites, even though you hadn't died. It was yet in the future, and being the sacrifice for our sin, even though it was long in the past. The heart of the gospel, God is the Creator of all of us. We have sinned against our Creator. Wrath and judgment has been pronounced upon us. But we have been given the gospel which offers us forgiveness through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You really see the gospel in the heart of God in the story of Jonah. The Creator God sinned against, warns about judgment, and fully forgives those who repent and embrace Him. Our Father, we thank You tonight for the story again, familiar story of Jonah, which reminds us that You are the Creator whom we have offended and sinned against. You are the judge who has pronounced condemnation, eternal damnation on us, but You are also the God who offers forgiveness for those who repent and believe the gospel of Christ. And it is because we have come to believe that gospel that salvation is provided for all who repent and all who believe in You through the work of Christ. Thank You, O God, for the provision You've made in Christ. We thank You, blessed Holy Spirit, for giving us life and faith, even as You gave to the Ninevites. 
to put our trust in the one Savior. You may actually mature to the point where you see the positive blessings of being a believer and you will mature to the point where you will love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, at least in a relative sense, and you will long to honor and serve Him and love will overpower fear, but fear is where we all began. This speaks to the issue that people who evangelize today by constantly saying, God loves you with an unconditional love, He loves you with an unconditional love, don't you want to be loved by God, miss the point. Did I not enjoin upon you, O children of Adam, that you not worship Satan? For indeed, he is to you a clear enemy. And by the way, Jonah was kind of a microcosm of a whole national failure. Jonah was like a living symptom of national disgrace. The Jews, the people of God, were placed in the world as a witness nation. They, they were to declare to the world the one true and living God. They were to take the message of the one true and living God to the polytheistic, polydemonistic world. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. They were chosen people, not as an end, but as a means to an end. They were to be a nation of missionaries. They were to be zealous for other nations to love and worship the true God. And they were to give corporate testimony of the greatness and the goodness and the power and the mercy of their God as demonstrated in their lives and declare their God to be the true God to the world and invite the world to come to know the true and living God. Instead they became racist and full of hate and animosity and that's why God allowed at a later time the Assyrians to come and obliterate the northern kingdom for good. Within the nation of missionaries, God selected certain specific prophets to lead the missionary task. And their responsibility was to proclaim the true God beyond Israel. He's in the fish and he prayed, verse 1 of chapter 2, to the Lord is God from the stomach of the fish. And uh, I, he says, I called out of my distress to the Lord. He answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. He's looking back and remembering his prayer in the past as he writes this. He's rehearsing his prayer. You had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me, and all your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Then he survived and he turned to worship. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. You have brought me, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. He's having a worship time before the Lord. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, there's no specific request here, but there's a desperate cry in this situation. But what he turns to is worship, worship, and he knows that God is his only hope. And he makes a commitment to God that I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. If you save me out of this, Lord, I will serve you. I'll keep my promise to you. The vow that I made to you when I confessed you as my Lord and my God, out of those suffocating and unimaginable circumstances comes this amazing prayer. Now he wants to have a God of grace and a God of compassion and a God of mercy and a God of loving kindness, and he knows that his only hope is in the goodness of God. The Lord commands the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. I don't know how the fish got to the dry land or I don't know how far the fish projected that man <laughs> when he threw him up, but he landed on ground, submerged in the depth of the ocean, comes to God with a worshiping heart, praising God, promising God He will be faithful. 
Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. The rest of the city had a circumference that extended to sixty miles around, very large metropolis. The name Nineveh is thought to have derived from Ninus, which would derive from Nimrod and means the residence of Nimrod or Nunu. Nunu, by the way, in Akkadian means fish, so maybe this was fish town, which would be an appropriate name. Why would they call a town fish town if it was 500 miles from the water? Well, because they worshiped the fish god, Nenshi, the daughter of Ea, the fish goddess of fresh water, and they also worshiped the fish god Dagon who had the head of a fish and the body of a man. Fish were of particular importance to the Ninevites, fresh water fish and these fish gods. He had a good fish story for fish town. And some historians actually think that he may well have looked like an albino because the fish's stomach acids may have bleached his skin so that he arrives in Nineveh with a distinctly white, almost ghostly appearance to tell his fish story. Well, Jonah's message was more than a fish story. It was a threat. Chapter 3, verse 4, Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Nineveh will be destroyed. Forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. And he just kept saying that and saying that and saying that all day as he walked. And then in one of the most understated verses in all of Holy Scripture to describe a monumental, miraculous working of God, you read verse 5, then the people of Nineveh believed in God. Really? I would like a little more detail about just how that happened. 600,000 people pagan people, worshiping Dagon, worshiping Nanshi, living lives of pagan idolatry with all that goes with it, a vile, wicked, evil people doing horrific things, slaughtering people, decapitating them, dismembering them. What? The people of Nineveh believed in God. Arise, go to Nineveh the great city and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. Arise, go to Nineveh, preach the message that I tell you. O Prophet, sufficient for you is Allah and for whoever follows you of the believers. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you." He's right. He, he gets it. He knows this is direct work of God. Um, they, uh, they're reluctant to do that. They have a certain amount of uh, human love. Uh, they, they don't really want to do that. The men rowed desperately in verse 13 to return to land, but they couldn't for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. Now they've come to understand who Jonah's God is, the Lord. And they're praying to the Lord and saying, Look, we don't want to toss this guy in the water because that's going to put blood on our hands. And then we're going to be guilty and we're going to be in trouble. However, verse 13 says, The men who were rowing desperately we're only fighting against an impossible situation because it became stormier. Their uh, prayers weren't going to help. So verse 15 says, they finally picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then there was a little revival on the boat. The men feared the Lord greatly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord, made vows. I don't know the full extent of that, but I think when Jonah explained to them who God is, they listened and they understood. 
And then when they saw the demonstration of the miraculous ceasing of the storm, they understood that this was the true God. They'd never seen anything like that because none of their false gods could do miracles. They became believers in the message that Jonah gave them. For it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry." That is just so strange. This is, this is unthinkable. And this is when he says to the Lord, I knew you would do this. I knew you were gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. I knew you would relent on your judgment on those people. This is so deep in him. Listen to verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Wow! Kill me! I can't stand the Assyrians being converted. This is his worst nightmare. Boy, that's some attitude for a prophet. He had a rotten attitude at the beginning. You can see how really rotten it is at the end. He is full of prejudice, pride. And he cannot tolerate the magnitude of God's grace to a barbarian nation. He wants nothing to do with this. He would rather be dead than see people converted to Christ or converted to God, I mean. This is aggravated to such an extreme degree. What he hoped for was that he would preach destruction, go on a hill wait forty days and watch it come and love every minute of it. The Lord says in verse 4, do you have good reason to be angry? Is there a reason for this? There's no answer to that. Of course there isn't. He's simply asking a rhetorical question to expose his prejudice. He's going to hope that God changes His mind. Well, why would God do that? Oh, He's going to hope that their repentance was hypocritical, superficial, short-lived. That's His hope. They didn't mean it. It isn't real. And if I just sit here and wait, God will destroy them all. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city? in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. That's how we get the number 600,000 for the city because there's 120,000 children who don't know their right from their left. He's full of contempt. He wants to see God condemn a whole city to hell. He's self-centered. What he is saying is, make me comfortable and send that city to hell. Boy, that is a twisted approach. And God teaches him a lesson. You had compassion on a plant to keep you comfortable and no compassion for eternal souls. Shouldn't I have compassion on Nineveh, that great city? And that's where it ends. I wish you had a final word from Jonah. The book of Jonah, a subversive story about a rebellious prophet who hates God for loving his enemies. But this book doesn't actually focus on the words of the prophet, rather it's a story about a prophet, a really mean and nasty prophet. We're told that Nineveh was a gigantic city it would take days to walk through. So Jonah gets one day in and here is his message. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. It's five words in Hebrew. Now his sermon is very short and it's also odd. I mean, look at what's missing. There's no mention of what the Ninevites have done wrong or of what they should do to respond. There's no mention of who might overturn them. And most noticeable, there's no mention of God. What's going on here? Has Jonah intentionally given the bare minimum of information? It's like he's trying to sabotage his own message or ensure the Ninevites' destruction. There's just no effort on Jonah's part here. Whatever his motives are, the plan doesn't work. Because no sooner does he utter this five-word sermon that the king of Nineveh, the entire city, including all its cows, repent in sorrow and ashes. So for the second time, these evil pagans show themselves to be more responsive than God's own prophet. 
the last word of Jonah's short sermon, overturned, means just that, turned over. And it can refer to a city being overthrown or destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah, but it can also be used of something being transformed, like turned over and changed into its opposite. And so, comically, Jonah's words actually came true, but not in the way that he intended. Nineveh does get turned over as Jonah's enemies repent and find God's mercy. The final chapter brings all the pieces together. Jonah, he's fuming mad, and he utters his second prayer. He first tells God why he ran away back in chapter 1. It was not because he was afraid. Rather, it was because he knew that God was so merciful. And this is great. Jonah actually quotes God's own description of himself from the book of Exodus, and he throws it back in God's face as an insult. He says he knew that God is compassionate and that you would find some way to forgive these horrible Ninevites. You can just hear the disgust in Jonah's voice. Jonah then cuts off the conversation and he prays that God would kill him on the spot. He'd rather die than live with the God who forgives his enemies. Fortunate for Jonah, God doesn't comply and simply asks if Jonah's anger is even justified. Jonah ignores the question and he goes outside the city to camp on a nearby hill, waiting to see what might happen. You know, the Ninevites might repent of their repentance and get roasted after all. God's final words are what concludes the book. He says that this whole vine incident was an attempt to get through to Jonah, right? Jonah got all concerned and emotional over this vine, which he only enjoyed for a day. And God asked Jonah, you know, aren't humans a bit more valuable than vines? I mean, isn't it okay if God might feel the same kind of emotion and concern for the city of Nineveh that's full of thousands of people who have lost their way and also their cows? And that's how the book ends, with God asking Jonah for permission to show mercy to his enemies. And what is Jonah's answer? The story doesn't say. And so this strange story actually becomes a message of good news about the wideness of God's mercy that ought to challenge us to the core. And that's the book of Jonah. But God makes a promise that one day a human will be born who won't give in to the beast. Rather, he'll overcome and strike the beast while being struck by it. Okay, so for the rest of the biblical story, we're waiting for that human. But instead, in story after story, we find people acting like beasts. He was claiming to be that truly human one on a mission to confront the beast. He was tempted to seize power on the beast's terms. But unlike every human before him, Jesus resisted the urge. And then he went about banishing the beast from people's lives, and he was teaching people how to rule the beast instead of being ruled by it.
Whatever you've been brought up to think, whatever you've been taught, whatever, we should not stick to our guns because we just can't give it up. When it comes to anything involving the intellect, you can give it up. If logic, reason, truth takes you in a different direction. You should follow the truth. Don't necessarily follow what you've always thought. And at a point, you just start saying, you know, maybe there are some differences that can't be reconciled. And if you can't reconcile the differences, they can't be all historically reliable. And maybe that doesn't matter to you, which is fine. I mean, if it doesn't matter to you, uh, it's fine. But uh, you shouldn't say then that every word in here is accurate because it's not. The man of lawlessness is the dreaded Antichrist. Lucifer will appear to be a glorious man, but he will be a demon wearing a garment of glorious light. The greatest deception to ever occur on earth will soon take place, and Christians, by and large, do not have a clue. To start the Bible, to make their assertion work. And he's also known throughout the scripture as Lucifer, Satan, that ancient serpent, the devil himself. The devil will masquerade around the world as Almighty God. Billions of people will see him perform miracles, amazing miracles, signs and wonders. Billions of people will fall down and worship him, believing that he's Almighty God. And indeed, Jesus will be a sign for knowledge of the hour. So be not in doubt of it, and follow me. This is a straight path. And many of them were saying, He has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? All right, now we've got another element. He is insane. He is a maniac. He is a madman. You are not, O prophet, by the favor of your Lord, a madman. Their holy writings say this, the Mahdi will come riding on a white horse, and it even says in their writings, as it says in Revelation 6, 1 and 2. A time will come when the world will be full of injustice. The world will be dark and bleak and black. And in that darkness, Allah will send a light for the ummah. In that darkness, when it looks like there is no hope, 
Allah Azza wa Jal will send someone who will unite the Muslims and will then change the situation of the earth from injustice back into uh, justice. So this is one of the beautiful predictions that terrifies us but also gives us comfort that you know it will get bad but after it gets bad inshallah it will be good the rulers of their times will know that this person is a threat to us why we do not know maybe in his ancestry with somebody maybe rumors are spreading he's the Mahdi we don't know but the rulers will say this man is a threat and this by the way when this happens this is the sign the Mahdi has come until that happens Nobody can claim to be the Mahdi. So the Mahdi will grudgingly take the bay'ah. Because even the Mahdi himself will say, no, no, it can't be me. I'm not good enough. He will deny it. And this is what true leadership does. True leadership, they don't want to be leaders. He shall be the leader of the entire Muslim ummah. For John to baptize Jesus was strange. It was even offensive. It was even embarrassing to believers, even after the early writing of the New Testament. But why then would He be baptized? Why would He go down into the symbolic river of death and as if He needed to die to His old life and come out new? Chapter 9 and verse... 24, a second time they called the man who had been blind and they knew he could see and they said, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He's a sinner. He's demon-possessed. He's like a Samaritan. He's an outcast and a traitor. And that's what they said to the people. And anyone who followed him would be literally put out of the society. So know, O Prophet, that there is no deity except Allah, and ask forgiveness for your sin, and for the believing men and believing women. And Allah knows of your movement and your resting place. So in the end, what do we learn? This is about God, this book. Uh, it, it's on the surface about Jonah, but underneath it's about God. What does it tell us about God? Well, we just draw a few simple lessons. First of all, that God is uh, the ultimate hero of the story. He's the one who uh, rescues Jonah. He's the one who gives Jonah the message. He's the one who makes the people hear the message, believe the message, repent and be converted and come to worship Him. It's about God. But if you break it down, first of all, it's about God as the sovereign creator. It is God who does all of this. It is God who has power over creation. Even the pagan sailors recognize God as the creator. Surprisingly, the only person in the story who resists God is Jonah. Sailors don't resist God. Ninevites don't resist God. Only the prophet of God. You, you just really are convinced that God ought to get somebody else, but God is in the business of doing mighty, massive work through people that from a human viewpoint would be discarded. And that should be encouraging to all of us because we're all flawed. Second, we not only learn that God is the Creator who controls everything sovereignly. But we learn that God is a supreme judge. The message that Jonah was to give was the message of judgment. Forty days and Nineveh, Nineveh will be destroyed by divine fury and divine wrath. Recognizing their doom was imminent, the Ninevites repented. And that takes us to the third and final element that we learn about God, and that is that God is a gracious Savior. His loving kindness is not limited by our prejudices, our pride, our indifference. His uh, loving kindness and compassion and grace is not limited to good people, but to brutal, murderous, idolatrous pagans. 
When Jesus brought clear proofs, he said, I have come to you with wisdom, and to make clear to you some of that over which you differ. So fear Allah, and obey me.